I was going to ask you. So let's kick off the conversation. I I I uh, I discovered you a, a, probably about six months ago, and um, since then I've come to when I talk to people about you, which I've had to talk to a couple people about you. I come to terms with. I basically describe you as just like a very pragmatic, normal person in a sea <laughs> of crazy individuals in the political space. That's the way. Now I don't know if you consider yourself that way. But I, I genuinely see you that way. I see you as somebody who's grounded in history, grounded in facts. You seem to, to have a very good understanding of American history. <laughs> and you come across as just a, compl- a normal, like, easy to understand, like, person with a good head on your shoulders. So I am curious, just like, I wanted to know what got you to where you're at. Because you have a really large platform. And I feel like nowadays the people that actually grow in this space, especially in YouTube and on social media and the political space, are the people that have some real extreme views, right? Um, and I am, I am curious as to like your origin story, like what brought you here? Because I know you're a teacher, right? Yeah, I was. I, well, technically you could say I still am. You know, I just have viewers as my students mm-hmm. <laughs> because uh, I taught in the classroom um, – from grades uh, start as young as seventh grade all the way up to 12th grade for over 12 years, uh, different districts, rural, suburban, urban schools. And the entire time I was making videos because my first career was uh, TV and radio broadcasting. And so communications was always something I uh, specialized in more because I like it. It's fun. <laughs> but also it's weird because growing up I was really bad at communicating with others like I I had a speech impediment I was really shy um, when I took a speech class in college I was I remember being terrified so like the fact that I do this and the fact that I later got up in front of lots of people to, every day uh, is it, kind of amazing the more I think about it but yeah I also am, am a musician and so I have been on stage uh, to sometimes crazy crowds. I've met all kinds of people over the years. Um, being a teacher, a lot of times you get kids, you know, they have to be there. <laughs> and so you deal with all personality types. Um, I think when you're talking about um, social media, though, it's a very specific type of person, though. I, I don't think that represents society as a whole. Yeah. Um, I will say, Josh... Are you go by Joshua or Josh? Either one's fine, yeah. Either oh, okay. I when I first came across your tweets, I was like, man, this this guy's really articulate and really puts things well. So I, I don't know how that. I found I, I probably found out about you about six months ago as well. And I was yeah. like, oh this guy. Yeah. So anyway. No, that's good. So I appreciate that. It's actually funny you mentioned the speech class. So I I was also I'm I mean, just as many young people are when they're coming up through school, like petrified about public speaking. And I actually have a funny little story about that. When I, when I went into college, I told myself that I was going to take a speech class because I had to overcome that fear. It was one of the first things I did in my freshman year. And I decided to do it. It caused me so much anxiety. I actually threw up in the parking lot Oh, before wow. my first speech. That's how anxious I was about it. This was me yeah. as like a 17, 18-year-old kid. And in that speech class, I met my wife. If I never oh, no would kidding. have taken that class, I would have never met my wife. I would have never had my two, two sons. Um, and it was all because of the fact that I just decided to do that as a freshman in college and uh, changed my life. Um, not only, and it was a great class. By the end, I dealt with a lot of that fear, but it was, that was just a weird – you mentioned speech class is what I thought about. So, um, yeah. That's cool, man. So, okay, so you did, so you did history. Uh, you, 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 did, you, did you teach history? Is that what it was? Yeah, I taught everything from uh... – geography to american history to a push it's ap us history um yeah. world history economics i started the economics class at my uh, the last high school i taught they didn't even have an economics class and i was just astounded by that uh, i think it should be mandatory for every kid and it's in kansas here i don't know where you all are from but in kansas it's not mandatory it's an elective so uh i had to like hype up the class and make it fun go out of my way to make it interesting because when i took economics and College, I that was the first class I actually fell asleep in. I'll never forget that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, social studies overall. So when you watch my early videos, you'll see that they're purely curriculum-based. I specifically made them for my students in real life, 
And then I noticed that I could maybe take it more seriously when I realized other teachers were playing my videos to their students. And I was like, oh, mm-hmm. I, maybe I should put more effort into these. And and then one day I made more money doing that than I did teaching. So I love teaching. <laughs> yeah. And here I am. It's kind of crazy. Did you, so you started out by just posting really your curriculum online. Was there... Did you have a specific goal? Did you want to say, I want to teach this specific thing about history? Or was it just kind of a broad, a broad overlook of, of topics? What, what did you, what did you have in mind? Yeah. Uh, that's a great question, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, I would say my first videos, I was just literally searching to see if the video already existed over a topic. So for example, when I used to teach seventh grade, um, I wanted to, teach the, the kids uh, as quickly as possible about the Texas Revolution. So I searched for the Texas Revolution, and I didn't, all I found on, on uh, YouTube were, were student-made projects, and they were all fairly crappy videos. And I was like, all right, I guess I have to make a video about this. And so I remember staying up late one night to do it, and the kids loved it. And so the, the I mean, they, I don't know if they loved it, but they pretended <laughs> like they did. They were nice. They thought it was cool the teacher actually was in the video. Um, and so, yeah, my earliest videos are just curriculum-based. But then later on, I was like, well, uh, I, I kind of want to just follow my own curiosity. Um, also, like, I want to cover what I think is important and also what, what I know more about that's not necessarily curriculum-based. And so that's kind of how it, the channel evolved over the years. Gotcha. Nice. So, I was going to make a point about, you know, both of you talked about anxiety around communication, getting up in front of people. One of the things I've noticed is that people who, people who realize that they have to work at something to be good at it often end up being better at that thing than people who think they're just naturally good at it, right? <laughs> it seems to me that people who are realize they have to put in the work for something, that they, they tend to have a more developed um, ability to do that. At least that's kind of been my observation. So people who are, you know, who have trouble with a stutter or a fear of public speaking, when they can overcome that, they can work on that. They tend to have a better grasp, I think, of of um, of that subject. So I think, that, I think that's an interesting. It's interesting to hear both of you have those stories. That's a good point. It's interesting to me that you've gone this, you've gone through this journey, Matt, from creating YouTube videos to teach kids. It's basically an educational tool for you. To basically being at the center of a lot of these like. I mean, I don't know. You had a tweet the other day that went viral about not dehumanizing uh, MAGA, uh, which I thought was a great tweet, by the way. <laughs> um, and I see your stuff pop up often. I see you at the center of a lot of these conversations, which I don't know if you ever expected to be there <laughs> when you started doing this years ago. But I, I, I am, and this kind of goes back to what we opened the conversation with. Like, I feel like normal people, there's a war going on against normal people. Uh, especially in the political space. People that have really rational, centrist, liberal, you know, like classically liberal views are almost like seen as outcasts and the algorithms I think play a big part of that. But I am curious, like when you create content, like I think you created content about BLM the other day, how do you deal with the criticism um, and backlash? Like, do you get a lot of that? Um, Or, you know, like how do you balance that and and navigate that as a content creator? Yeah, I... I can handle the backlash. I'm ready for it. I got it when I was a teacher from, you know, 15 year olds. Uh, I, and I continue to get it in my comment sections. Honestly, the same 15 year olds probably, (laughs) 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 but I embrace, I I embrace the, uh, controversy because that is what tricks people into learning. Um, I intentionally choose controversial topics to cover because I know people are going to click on the video. That's what we all do when we say, like when I did the dehumanization uh, uh, of Trump supporters uh, tweet the other day. And for those who have no idea what we're, I, I basically just said uh, we shouldn't dehumanize Trump supporters is all I said. And I usually yeah. keep it intentionally open ended and vague on purpose because it kind of, you know, people kind of reveal themselves quickly when they respond. And yep. the message was sep- simple, like we shouldn't be um, attacking people just because they're ignorant or whatever. Um we should be attacking Trump, <laughs> you know, like if you, I, and so, but the, that message of course didn't get across, but that's okay because like it led to all these back and forth that did lead to a good discussion. And yeah, a lot of toxicity as well and outrage, but that's just part of the platforms. I mean, yeah. all social media is like that. It's how you, I tried to like direct a lot of that to 
learning whenever possible. Like, again, my, my mantra is to trick people into learning whatever I got to do. And so that also means like, I can't just be bashing people. I have to be respectful and treat others as human beings, you know, even if I personally disagree with them, but also like what you said at the very beginning, you're like, Oh, you just seem like a, a normal pragmatic dude. Well, it really helps that, um, I'm two things. One, I'm pretty cynical, like about any, anything. And, but more importantly, the second thing is I'm not ideological at all. I'm not married to ideas. I'm flexible. I realize that almost every issue, um, it's insane to be on one end of a spectrum or the other. There's always, almost always you're in between on, on a spectrum. And yeah. so when you view every issue that way, I think it automatically makes you like, okay, well, I can open myself up to different opinions. Yeah, it's it's almost like nowadays politics programs people to come to before you even ha look at a problem, you have a solution in mind, right? Like before you even <laughs> navigate or understand a problem, you're coming to it with a preconceived notion or a partisan bias or like uh, some sort of stigma against you know um, a certain set of answers that may in fact be the most pragmatic answers. It's interesting. I John and I come from. And I've spent 10 years in the libertarian movement, libertarian party, and I, I've always been considered myself more on the pragmatic side. Recently, I've stepped away from a lot of the stuff there because I've seen them kind of get absorbed into a lot of the more illiberal things that I've seen happen in the Republican Party. But uh, that's, that happens in like any political movement. People get so kind of caught up in the ideology or you know the, the, the dogma that they lose track of what's best to solve the problem. And, um, and then the people in the middle, the pragmatic people, are the ones that are, are without a platform because they, they can't get traction without, kind of re without being those dogmatic crazy people. <laughs> I, am, I am curious, and that speaks to like a broader division in society. You've spent a lot of time studying American history. Do you think there's ever been a time, like from a division perspective, that – is equivalent to what we're seeing now. Like, I mean, I get we had a civil war, right? So I know that we've had at least something similar. But like, do you have any thoughts on that broadly? <clears throat> the only the only other time was the 1850s, um, and that was worse. I do think that was worse. I, I've studied that that decade quite a bit, and um, you know there was a lot of violence. I mean, I'm, I live in Kansas, uh, where a lot of that violence actually went down, and they call it like the prequel to the Civil War bleeding Kansas uh, mm -hmm. because pro-slavery people uh, were murdering anti-slavery people and vice versa, uh, infamously John Brown and others. And uh, I think a lot of the division we see is between people that rarely touch grass. Uh, they are often just, yeah, like always on their phones. Like, you know, you go to the store, you go to uh, uh, the gym, other pl places that where people of different backgrounds and beliefs congregate, you don't see people shouting at each other or refusing to go to certain places because, like, oh, they are going to be there. No, like, mm -hmm. most of us get along just fine. I just think uh, a lot of the people that are, like, oh, civil the, uh, the next civil war is imminent, I think they're just terminally online. They need to get offline and interact with real human beings. And a lot of people are lonely right now, too. That's another thing we don't bring up enough. There's a lot of, there's a loneliness epidemic right now. I think that a lot of those toxic responses to us on social media, I, I just hate to say it, but I mean, it's, they need help. They need friends. <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's I, something absolutely to that. Yeah. I, I completely agree. I think and next week I'll be debating somebody about national divorce, right? And this idea, uh, I have a video a about that. Of, so what? I have a video about that. Oh, oh. There you, I'll have to, I'll have to check that out. I might've, uh, I've did, I did a debate last year. I might've actually watched one of yours. I don't know. I'll have to go, I'll have to go look. Cause I did look up what everybody was saying about national divorce. Um, but I think that it, it you know, there's kind of these, these narratives kind of arise. Like a lot of people, you know, people talk about civil war is imminent. There's a massive divides in this country. And I agree that there's massive divides in this country. How much of that is being fed by the kind of the social media algorithms and like it feeds social media really tends to kind of feed the negative way more than the positive. And you, 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 there's just such a huge imbalance between those two. I'm sure somebody somewhere has done a study on, on why, why or how much negative stories get promoted more than positive ones. Um, but how do you think that's fed into the discourse of the day? Is it the driver behind the discourse or is it really just revealing 
kind of the undercurrents um, that were already pre-existing? Or is it kind of a, probably a mixture of both? It is a mixture of both, but I would say it's mostly, I mean, this is, I, I don't think, uh, I have seen studies on this, but that doesn't mean it's like this is a, I mean, I would say this claim is mostly true that most of the division we see is driven by, uh, somebody put it this way, and it's an outrage economy because, uh, and that's what I admitted earlier, I use the outrage economy to my advantage when I'm yes. trying to educate folks, you know, when really what I'm trying to do is spread empathy, like almost ironically, is expose people to different, you know, things they would never be exposed to otherwise. And so when you are, I mean, our entire economy since the, um, for at least for the last 20 years has been built on, um, you know, uh, trying to get people to click on crap online. I mean, so much as just get, get them to click, get them to stay on that website and you got to do whatever you can to get them to stay on that website. Um, and that's how algorithms work on YouTube, you know, and, and they've made reforms. Uh, it's not as bad as it used to be, but that's where the incentives are. And I think the incentives have to change because we are naturally as human beings drawn towards, um, fear and loathing. Uh, the, the two things that drive so many people politically right now, fear and loathing. Um, we've got to figure out how not to. Or like at the very, actually, I I call people out all the time on Twitter. I say, you profit from hate and division. You know, a lot of pundits, like they know, they a lot of them don't even believe what they're tweeting out or no, saying. Yeah. They yeah. they just, oh, yeah. they know they're going to get a reaction and they know they're going to get attention. And negative attention is, is good, good press even these days. It's not just, you know, it's, uh, it's almost like you get rewarded for the more toxic you are. Yes. So that ha Yeah, because right now I'm thinking of an individual and I want to say his name, but I don't want to say his name. <laughs> don't say his name, yeah. Well, no, what I do mean, you guys think about like what's the solution to that? Well, that's what that's what I was going to ask you. I'm not I'm not sure there is much of one except trying to put out positive empath empathetic content. I think you know, empathy is something that really gets lost online. Yeah. Like my grand like for example, my grandmother, she um I I don't want to call her a racist, but she grew up and she was born in 1913. And one day we were sitting with her and we were showing her pictures of the past year. This, I guess, kids, I was born back in the time when we had photo albums, physical photo albums. Uh, but we were showing her pictures of like the past year or something. And pictures came up of where um, we had, st I forget, I think they stayed with us or we stayed with them for a night or two. I forget the situation, but with a black family. And we just had pictures of us. We didn't think anything about it. My grandmother looked at them and goes, you guys stayed with a colored family? And she just had this look on her face. And I just, I remember even as a, a 9, 10, 11 year old thinking, why does she have that look on her face? And I didn't realize until later on um, that it kind of offended her, I guess, in some way, shape or form. Um, and, and so I think that, but if that black family had shown up at her doorstep and asked for food, or asked for clothing, she would have given the clothes off her back to help them. But it was because we had stayed with, like, so she's, you know, it's this contradiction of she has these social norms built into her brain of blacks and whites should need to kind of be separate for, I don't know the extent that she believed that because she ended up having Alzheimer's in my, you know, in my teens, so I didn't really get to know her. Um, but I think that she had this conception of where, you know, this, the proper social norms were, but she still would have helped them if they had asked, you know? So... I, but I think about this, like, she would have, you know, if Twitter had existed back in the 1930s, maybe she would have been saying some horrible, awful things. But in real life, she would have actually helped people, right? So I don't, I hope she wouldn't have been online saying really not awful things. But I think that I kind of try to tell that story in the way that, hey, people, you know, people have different conceptions. And the pe personality they put online is probably not who they are in real life. I certainly Hope, well, hope but, that's the case. Yeah, and I've been seeing this, and you probably see this too. All both of you guys probably see this. Audience capture is a real problem. Uh, mm -hmm. The algorithms are absolutely incentivize people to go completely and totally ape shit. Like, I mean, they they incentivize you to get extremely what's the word um, uh, to 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 make things out to be far more extreme than they are. To to sense uh, to to you know to um, 
you know, uh, ex- exaggerate things, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the thing that's been the most shocking to me is audience capture. And I think that that's effectively what's going on with a lot of these big influencers is they, they, they build an audience, they build an audience, they build an audience, and they, they, they put something out there and they see what gets resonates and what doesn't. They do more of what resonates. And at some point they become something that they, act, they aren't even personally believe anymore. Um, mm. And it's incredibly hard to fight that, especially when you get to levels that I'm sure, like Tim Pool, or I just think of somebody in the libertarian movement, like Dave Smith. No names, no names, Josh. <laughs> We're not going to name them. Donald Those Trump, who yeah. shall not be named. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but I mean, these people get massive platforms, and they grow these audiences, and they say when they they see it, right? They know they can't maybe say what they believe truly, it's, and they they know what works and what resonates, and then they get rewarded for that, and it's just a, a, a vicious cycle, um, you know. Uh, so I, I, think I don't know how to, I, th- yeah. I think that there's also in a sense, like Alex Smith, I, I just, I, 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 I just said I wouldn't name names. Uh, Alex uh, Jones, I just said <laughs> I wouldn't name names, but here I am. I think they all, a lot of them create a personality to be online. And then that kind of morphs them into, the, they become that personality, right? They create the, this almost alter ego of a personality, of a belief system, and they kind of portray that online. And they don't really believe it. They don't really follow through with it. But then it kind of becomes something that they have to, they have to be that alter ego all the time. I'm not a psychologist, so take that with a grain of salt. But I think there's, I think that, you know, you talk about solutions. We have to figure out ways to identify those people and identify what they're doing. And that's, would, that's a tricky uh, thing. I would say that the root of most societal problems, structural problems are economic. And I, I think that we are... I mean, I know we're all market driven folks like I I do lean to the right economically in terms of like free markets, yada, yada. Um, But at the same time, like uh, sometimes you need government to step in to make it competitive. You want competitive markets. Well, we don't have competitive markets. We have just a handful of media uh, companies that own it all. They we're even seeing like the like I just saw a video today like uh streaming remember when streaming back uh 10 years ago when you, yeah. you could watch uh netflix for like six bucks a month no commercials and you had you didn't have to have like seven different accounts just to see find the movie you want to watch or uh i think that consolidation has been a bane on capitalism for a long time and we fought monopolies in the late 1800s early 1900s with the progressive era that's how we saved capitalism and I think we need to save it again because I think at the root of it is you have so many people that are desperate to make money and they will do whatever they can. They actually throw out ethics because they like, well, I've got to pay the bills. And I, I mean, you, you mentioned some, some pundits, you know, I, I feel like if you sat these people down and hung out with them, I think they'd be decent people. I think they would, you know, we would get along actually probably, but like you were saying, Josh, they, They've found out what makes them money, mm-hmm. and their audience has taken control. Um, and when they say when that, we say the audience, really, it's like it's just the audience is just also manipulated. So it's not like it's one way. Both sides are kind of just like so. These problems are systemic, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And I think at the root of it, we have to have it has to be easier for people to have economic opportunity because this is a scarcity kind of mindset where um, you see it, the same thing in poor communities around the world. Like, Oh, they're always looking for the quick way to make money. You know, you notice that pyramid schemes are thriving. Con artists are, are thriving. Like, look, the biggest con artist in the world, whoever existed, you know who, what his name is running for president again this year. He's the greatest con artist of all time. But the reason why he exists is not him. It's, He's a, a symptom of the of of our society. Why we need to ask ourselves why are we falling for con artists? It's because we're desperate. Like wealth inequality is worse now than it was during the Gilded Age. Something has to be done. We don't want it to be. <laughs> we don't want it to be communism, but we also don't want it to be fascism. Yeah. And so we folks that are kind of in the middle need to speak. I mean, we know. We see countries where it works, where capitalism works across the world. We see it. Uh, places like uh, Hong Kong and Singapore and uh, Europe, most European countries, well, for the most part, there's still problems. But like, well, I mean, even we're gonna, people are going to be continued. Like, yeah, populism, yeah. It, the only way to fight populism and radicalism 
is to, I mean, we have to give people, make it so that they feel like they don't have to uh, do whatever they can to make money. And I think that's the root of the problem. Sorry, I, I'm, I talked too long. No, not at all. No, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. You're completely dead on. I think there's a lot of things you said I agree with. I think the devil's in the details when we talk about, you know, like which which things constitute a monopoly and which things don't. I, I definitely personally yeah. agree with you that, like, you know, there's a role for antitrust. And if the government is going to step in, in into a market, it needs to be done in order to make markets more competitive, right? Like exactly. If, if, if there yeah. is a role of government in the market, it's to make markets more competitive. So I couldn't agree more with you on that. And you're right, in times of economic uncertainty, in times of unrest like this, con artists and strong men always do better. And the best way we can fix that problem is by enriching people's lives and, and uh, reducing inequality and, and doing all those things to make markets competitive and give people a chance to, to thrive. It's worth noting that a lot of the countries, even uh, the ones that communists talk about all the time, I was in a debate the other day on Twitter about with a communist on spaces, and he was saying... Um, Oh well, you know, Scandinavian countries are an example of, of uh, of how socialism works. And I go, Scandinavian countries on average have higher economic freedom in, or rank higher in the economic freedom index than the United States does. They're right? not socialist. <laughs> They're not. Right? They have. Although they do pay, they pay too much taxes to to my liking, income taxes. But yes. you know, for what they get, okay, fine. <laughs> yeah, they, they they have a bigger welfare programs a bigger state in that regard and they have a higher tax rate but like from an economic perspective uh, th you know they have more freedom and and yep. that's one of the things that i that, that you point to and it's actually it's the same thing i hear from communists about china they go oh china's this amazing success story about pulling all these people out of poverty and i go that was only done that only happened after they reformed in the 1990s to allow people to have more private property, 70s, 80s, and 90s. So yeah, I think yeah. it was the early 90s, right, when those major reforms happened. Uh, you began know, the in the 70s. Began in the, in 70s, the 70s, yeah. Okay. So it was really only their liberalization, their market liberalization, that resulted yep. in that. So I think that is the most, the most powerful tool. And that actually is the, that's what concerns me the most about the rise of right wing populism, especially uh, Trumpism, is they're regressing. So they see a problem, and the problem is a lack of economic competition. The problem is a lack of free markets. That's causing this consolidation, a lack of competitive markets, right? And their response to it is more isolationism, it's protectionism, <laughs> it's government intervention yeah. in the market, it's subsidies. These are things that will only take the problems that they're experiencing and make them far, far worse, right? If you want to fix those problems, you need to create a more competitive market, give people the ability to have economic mobility, and by, you know, making the cost to buy things overseas way more and increasing prices on consumers and then subsidizing the people that are you know, the farmers that you like, and you know, that will not result in that economic mobility, and it will only make the problem worse. So it's like a death spiral, right? And that's why I think it has to be addressed. So that's why it's such a big problem right now. Um, again, now I'm talking your ear off, but I, I couldn't agree more with you on no. that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm kind of, it's kind of a meme at this point where I, I rail against tariffs in my videos sometimes. I don't like to like share my opinions in my videos too often, but when I do, it's like, tariffs! I hate him. And people are all like, what? So What's guys, let's talk about the Jones Act now. <laughs> <laughs> so dorky. I, yeah. Yeah. I, boy, I, um, yeah, tariffs are one of those things. It's one of the, you can always say, well, the other country pays for it. No. No. We pay for the tariffs. It's yeah. one of the, you know, companies don't pay taxes. Their, their customers do. Like, that's at the bottom line. You can tax a company all you want to, but at the end of the day, they're going to pass most of that off to their, to their consumer. Um, so you've, we've kind of talked about some algorithms. We talked about, tried to talk about some solutions. Do you see, do you think you just need, do we need more Mr. Beats out there uh, spreading empathy? Do like, what other things can people do? Um, not just try to, you know, top down solutions, but bottom up solutions. Do we need more people out there calling out bad faith actors? Um, what other, what other things can we do from the bottom up? Yeah. Uh, I do think it is important to uh, – I think the most important video I made in recent months was um, how do you know if something is true or not. So that's it's just a media literacy video, and I wish I would have learned these things when I was younger because I used to fall for – uh, scams, you know, yep. I, uh, and I also was very religious growing up and I, too. Uh, I just didn't critically think. And, and so, yeah, like, I think so many people like, you know, you just give them a little bit of, I mean, people are naturally, naturally curious. You, sometimes it just needs to, some work to, you know, to 
unleash that. And so, um, but yeah, if they are able to critically think and, and be media literate, um, that's a start. Um, and then from there, they'll be able to see the con artists more, more easily and the demagogues and et cetera. Yeah. Um, and then on the, the other part of it is I think we just need to keep encouraging people to be um, active civically, um, not just at the federal level, but especially the local level. Like my home town is um, – they're making big changes in terms of zoning, which I think is one of the biggest reforms that we can all make at the local level across the country. Is like uh, It's another example of how there's this too much uh, – Bureauc- bureaucracy. Uh, why I can't say that word sometimes. It's, bureaucracy. I, I always forget yeah, to spell um, that word. <laughs> yeah, the French. No, the French. The, the, the zoning. French. <laughs> That's always the French. Uh, the zoning uh, had reforms that I'm seeing, and this is a lot of times grassroots. It's really inspiring. And yeah, I said earlier I'm a cynical guy, but I'm, I also like to see like there are glimmers of hope. Yeah. Um, the the uh, what's it called? The Yimby movement. Mm-hmm. I think that's one example. Like. So getting involved with local politics, um, I think, is also kind of another bi- important part of that. I, I uh, actually well, want to point you, I wanna, if you don't mind, Jonathan, I got a quick comment on that because you talk about Yimbyism. That's actually uh, indicative of what I see as a, a major civil war happening on the left. So, you know, for this, for the sake mm-hmm. of our audience and maybe explaining to you kind of where we're at with this whole thing is, I see both on the left and the right right now massive civil wars and infighting going on. On the far right, it's like the – I'd say it's the liberal Republicans versus the liberal MAGA, right? It's these kind of like right-wing populists and demagogue lovers versus – some. sometimes these were former establishment people. Sometimes they're just pro-market kind of conservative people. On the left, I actually see it as a fight between the far left – Many of these people are pretty liberal, especially when you look at the way they responded to like uh, October 7th and what happened after the whole Israel-Palestine thing. Uh, Anti-market leftists and pro-market liberals. And, um, And I see this playing out in our political space, and I almost think that we're in a moment, and this talk goes back to the hope that we talked about, where there is a space now for actually a legitimate liberal kind of centrist, pro market you know, pro-liberal values movement that kind of unites those two sides that were cast out from a, by the far left and the far right. Hmm. And um, the success of the Yimby movement, I think, is a great example of that. That's been led in many cases by people that are consider themselves center left, that in my mind, when I was growing up, when I was younger, would have been considered Democrats and maybe even like less pro-market. But I'm seeing a departure on the left, like a, a, a move towards free markets, like they're recognizing the, the role that markets play in enriching people. And um, I think they're kind of joint – this is the early stages of this new coalition. It's the whole reason why hmm. we started Project Liberals because we see this kind of thing forming. And I think it pre- presents an unprecedented opportunity electorally um, that could really push things in the right direction. It's, uh, there's a lot of things that have to happen to make it work. But that's, um, that's been a huge glimmer of hope for me. Um, cool. It is interesting to watch Democrats particularly start to take on – kind of the pro-free market side of things as Republicans are tilting away from it, right? And the ter- pro-tariffs, pro-isolationism. Um, it is interesting. It is interesting to see that kind of, that shift in the political parties happen in real time. Because, you know, 2030, you know, back in the, 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 the Reagan, through Clinton, through Bush eras, it seems to me, and I know there were definitely changes in there, it seems to me that they, both of the parties were very, you know, uh, very stable. They both had their own viewpoints. There was plenty of overlap during that time uh, between the parties, right? You had pro, uh, pro-life pro Democrats. You had pro-choice Republicans during that time. Um, and generally speaking, they kind of they kind of sailed along pretty evenly. Um, obviously, some would win, some would lose, et cetera, et cetera. But generally speaking, the parties themselves didn't change that much over that time. Whereas in the past decade or two, we've just seen this major internal changes within the parties. And I'm curious... Is there any other time in American history where we've had both political parties just really kind of flipping the script on internally? That's why I think we're entering the uh, the next party system. Uh, if I mostly have videos about uh, American political history in my channel, and we have the different party systems. You know, like we've my entire life basically. <clears throat> I mean, when I was born, Ronald Reagan was president, and we've been in the Reagan era pretty much up until Trump. Trump has tapped into something new, but it wasn't just Trump. It was also Bernie. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think it's populism. But at the same time, 
populism doesn't have to be bad. Like a lot of people, yeah. I think, automatically get these, oh, like it's a pejorative, because there are things that are popular that ordinary folks uh, are acutely aware of, and they agree on them. Like there are so many issues where it's like 65 to 70 percent of Americans agree, for example. Like uh, the first example I, I always go to is marijuana legalization. I mean, come on. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's above 70 percent now at this point. Uh, another issue is that's uh, really popular is some version of uh, either public health care or universal health care, something where it's not, I mean, our health care system is a disaster. So, like, pretty much most Americans agree that they, we, we want something better. Um, the, the devils are in the details, yes, yep. but, uh, but that could be another unifying issue. Um, even, like, universal basic income, I see potential there as a unifying issue because it, what it does is it takes away the identity politics, it takes away the culture war, and it just says, hey, everybody, you know, if you are a citizen. Also, like, there's the, you know, when you talk about the, the Trump wing of the Republican Party, which is basically most of the party these days, I think it's mostly just reactionary. And I think after he, um, after he dies, uh, I think a lot of that will die with him. Because when I look at the future of the party and I look at folks like uh, Ron DeSantis or uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, I notice they actually have ideas, and uh, Trump really doesn't have that many ideas. Like, he really looked like, my wife asked me this the other day, she's like, what is his platform? Like, what is he running on? All he does is just, like, make fun of people. Um, but some of the younger, I mean, I really do think it's not all bad, like, like some of his supporters, because they do have ideas, and a lot of them are actually open to ideas that I think would appeal to those on the left end of the spectrum as well. So that, that is also inspiring to me. Yeah, I I wonder I wonder what the where we're gonna land in coalition wise because I I see that I I have a bit of skepticism like especially with the people like Vivek Ramaswamy and Ron DeSantis like Vivek Ramaswamy for example a lot of people in my orbit are big fans of his um, and I think that's because he he kind of tries to tap into like what would be traditionally libertarian sentiment in a lot of ways yeah like he, he's he, like Ron Paul basically yeah Ron Paul exactly the, right. he Gen tries Z. to lean it. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of stuff that he that he stands for that I don't agree with, and there's some stuff in there that I find incredibly dangerous. Like, um, you know, the fact that he's talking about great replacement theory and stuff like that. Uh, he's, you know, calls transgenderism like a mental illness, and he's called climate change a hoax and all that. There's stuff that I think that it's I rhetorical. Think... I don't think he believes it. I really. Same well, and I don't. Like... <laughs> but my you concern know, he's just is that what they want to hear. Yeah, 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 and you could be right. You could be right. I, <laughs> I, I am torn between the idea that, hey, we might have this whole like new slew of solutions that come out of this, and the other idea that once Trump dies, we're going to have a illiberal right wing populist that gets you know, gets like in control of things, but actually isn't is like conniving and smart and doesn't just care about people kissing his ass. And then that might actually present a far more of a dangerous People uh, say that about DeSantis, Be yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could so, say about yeah. DeSantis or, or yeah. Vivek. I mean, Vivek has got a lot of stuff I agree with, but there's the stuff that I disagree with that I see is far more dangerous that overshadows a lot of that. And that's the reason why I've spoken out against uh, his campaign a lot. I, Donald that. Trump, Donald Trump sounds much worse than a lot of other candidates. As far as like what he plans on doing and what he says he's going to accomplish, but I don't. I'm not afraid of his presidency simply because he's not politically savvy. He doesn't know how to get legislation passed. He's yeah. not able to really implement a lot of these things. Now, don't get me wrong. He could put people in place. He could have advisors that cabinet, that yeah. do that. So that worries me. Um, but I think that I kind of want. I would rather choose an inept candidate uh, who <laughs> says who who says things that I disagree with than a skilled. A uh, politician who would actually get things done that are really bad. Um, now that's not a good. I don't like either of those choices. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, you make um, a good point. Yeah, but I, I do think that's why DeSantis scared me a lot more than than a Donald Trump per se. Um, but I I kind of want to go back. I think a lot of people a lot of people really want to want a candidate who is willing to lie to them to make them feel good. And I've yeah. seen this a lot with especially with Vivek Ramaswamy. Um, where they say, well, you know, he's, um, he's, or, or no, no, really Nikki Haley and, and Trump, they say, well, Trump, so many people, so many libertarians say, well, Trump was against the wars. He didn't stop any wars. He actually droned, droned more people. Um, yeah. but no, Nikki Haley's for the wars. 
Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna say that Trump is better on this issue because he actually says things against it. Well, no, he should have done something against it if he actually was against the wars. So yeah, sure, criticize Nikki Haley for her for her neocon policies all you want to. But Trump actually uh, went through with those policies when he was in office. But sure, he talks against it now. What does that do? Actually, vote for people who are going to get things done that you want, and not just not just soothe your you know soothe your ego a little bit by saying things you want to hear. Yeah, actions speak louder than words, uh, but apparently not to a lot of voters. <laughs> they do. No, you're no. right. The, the, it's again, it's rhetoric. Uh, I think a, a lot of times people, oh, this what they're saying makes me feel good, so that's it. They don't actually look at their records, or they look they don't look at the policies. Um, yeah, that's the that's the dark side of populism, I guess. The yeah. The, you touched you touched on this a second ago, Matt, and I actually want to come back to it. Um, you were talking about the importance of raising your children and helping other people understand how to identify misinformation and be educated voters and civically active. Uh, I'm sure you have an incredible amount of things to talk about in that regard because you've you've spent time teaching K through 12, and I'm sure you probably lived that life for a long time. Uh, I just, I, you know, I've got two kids under two right now, and I think about that a lot. Like, I was also raised in a very religious family. Um, I was from a group of people, I'm going to just be honest, I love all my family, I love my extended family, but they were incredibly conspiratorial. Uh, it wasn't a, it was like, it was like they would... They go hand in they, hand, they, by the way. Huh? They do. Re yeah, they do. Especially, especially where I was, and I don't know thinking. where you were. Yeah. I don't know where you were, Matt, but I was Pentecostal, evangelical, Christian growing up. Um, that stuff's pretty common in that, those spaces, right? Uh, especially the ones that are very, very radical. Um, and I, I think it was only my mother, because I was, I was never went to public school. I was K through 12, homeschooled. I did do some oh. co-ops when I was in middle school and high school, but I think there's something about my mother. We, we delve really deep into into history we we really did try to look at the facts i was taught young earth creationism but i was taught like a framework of thinking that helped me almost pick apart my own education and i don't know what it was i'm still trying to figure that out for the sake of my own children but it was something that like after i actually got into high school and started looking at online i realized a lot of the things that i was taught were actually wrong and i started rethinking those things and it's caused me to basically have like skepticism in going into everything so like do you feel like the education system adequately prepares young people today i mean it may not be a monolith and i'm curious as to whether or not you you like have any commentary on just tactics like as me as a parent like somebody who's taught to young people for as long as you have like do you do you think there's anything that you could do that makes it that makes people more likely to be curious or more likely to be critically think uh, you know question narratives yeah that's the challenge i think is because i think the reason why you and i probably escaped this fundamentalism is because of our natural curiosity that just kind of we just kept asking questions where, yeah. whereas a lot of people they stop asking questions because well i have all the answers i need so why do i need to keep, keep answering questions and yeah so the uh i do think that there needs to be a lot of reforms with schools in terms of um getting kids to keep asking questions and never be satisfied because so much of schooling is and this isn't just the united states based I think this is a lot of countries. It's just so much about obedience and like, yeah, follow the rules, jump through these hoops. Then we give you the diploma. And even in college, the same thing. You just got to like keep jumping through the hoops and you don't even necessarily have to know this stuff that well, but you are accomplishing what you need to accomplish. I mean, I taught, uh, actually I taught seventh grade through 12th grade, so I didn't get the youngins, but I do. Okay. My daughters are not 12 and nine now. And so I, I kind of see, I mean, I can already tell you that they're they're fine because um, I do like constantly challenge them as a, I always, and then they're challenging themselves. They're, they just keep. I mean, one of the best things you can do is just keep asking questions. And uh, as a teacher, I was always the devil's advocate because even if a student like you know I teach American government as well. That's another class I taught. I love teaching mm -hmm. that, obviously. Um, when I taught that to high schoolers, and a student said something that I agreed with. I would challenge them <laughs> yeah. and I was not afraid because like, um, and also my students sometimes change my mind. I always bring up the example of, I used to have debates on, um, uh, 
different issues. One of the, the key things we always debated was whether or not it was justified to use atomic bombs uh, mm -hmm. against Japan at the end of World War II. And I used to be firmly on the side of, um, no, it was not okay. It was a mistake that Truman authorized that, yada, yada. And now I'm actually, I lean more towards the side of, he probably should have done that. Um, and that is a big reason why I was doing those debates. Like I had students that literally like changed my mind. So I think Whatever teachers have to do and whatever parents have to do to get kids to constantly, constantly challenge their own beliefs um, and not be ideological, um, I think that's that would go a long way. I really yeah, do think that would go a long way. That is something that's huge. Avoiding ideological, it's it's. I don't like using dogma. the word yeah dogma yeah. in the classroom. Like the the role of an educator, and I think this should be something. If you're going to talk about education policy, this is relevant. The role of an educator should be again to challenge people's misconceptions. That, that's really powerful to say. And I think a lot of like a lot of educators. I mean, I don't think they think through things in that framework. I, I do think that are they paid enough to, to think through things in that framework? <laughs> They're probably so, not paid enough to think think, think that way. That could be. Oh, I'm sure we can. I'm sure we can get into a whole discussion <laughs> about the bureaucracy of the school system and how that you know that that affects teaching and. Boy, I bet that's a that's a rabbit hole. But one thing I was going to bring up here is, you know, we talk about people not thinking critically enough. I think kind of the same thing is a lot of people who, you know, a lot of people call themselves, uh, you know, red pilled or or you know they they blame everybody else for being blue pilled because they 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 don't believe anything they see. Right? We we hear we talked about people who believe everything they they read or hear or see. Then there's the People who call, well, I'm red pilled, so I'm just not going to believe anything I read or see or hear. And yet, somehow, they always come to the exact conclusions that they really wanted to at the beginning, right? So they only believe the evidence that they actually want to believe in the end. It's not actually that they're that you know they're that much more uh, critically thinking than other people. It's just hey, they're going to reject everything to come to their own conclusions, as opposed to believing everything to come to their own conclusions. So I, it's just a flip side of the other coin. And how do you? How do you reach these people who just don't refuse to believe any kind of evidence that you put forward to them and and they're always falling back on that on that on that position? I think treating them with kindness uh, but also epistemology, ask them how they know what they know, ask them why they know what they know, um, what are their sources? You don't have to like be like you know uh, antagonistic. <laughs> Um, citation needed, ha, 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 you know, as we do online. No, but like just have a conversation back and forth. Like, how where are you getting this information? And a lot of times, like, you can kind of see them. I mean, what happens whenever I do that, often the field, field goal uh, post is, the goal post is moved. That's yeah. usually what happens. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, oh, but. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and I think that, but I think I do think it's effective. I've found success. Like, I just also think about my own life. That's how I change my mind on things um is because you know i used to think i had everything figured out when i was 18 years old <laughs> yep people did the same I, thing to me though like how do you know what you know i don't know get, that, getting yeah. people to question things is the number like one of the, i i grew up in very much like josh uh with evangelical background but i grew up in more of a almost a cult setting um so i've kind of come from that background and one of the things i've been very interested in is studying how do you bring people out of cults and the reality is you have to get them to question what they believe you cannot question it yourself because then you're attacking them you have to yeah. get yeah there the motivation to question things has to come from within them so you just asking questions being willing to learn from them tell I, them i want to learn about what you believe and why you believe it and the purpose behind it that's the best way to get people to open up and and it's not just you're wrong here's why you're wrong here's the facts list this one two three four five you're wrong this is it you know your whole view and the world view is 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 nonsense you know stop believing it it's never going to change anybody's mind it has to come from within somebody they have to change their mind you can never convince somebody else to well said if you guys haven't checked this out you should this was something again i find it interesting how much religion is tied to this conversation because that was my entry point as a young person into really challenging my entire world view and kind of going down this path was like answering those questions from my childhood but if you haven't checked out street epistemology have you guys seen that Mr. I've B, heard of it. So th yeah. there's this there's an entire group of people that do this thing street epistemology where they'll put a they'll, and this is a YouTube channel I used to watch back in the late 2010s. They strap a GoPro on their chest, they bring out a little clipboard, and they go sit up somewhere like at a park or at a at an event or something, 
And they would just basically say, hey, will you guys will, will you be willing to talk to me for 60 seconds and answer some questions about your worldview? And they would do the, you know, you know, they would do, a, a, you know, epistemology with these people, just ask them questions. And watching mm-hmm. people really wrestle with their own worldview when challenged with these questions, it, it's, it's funny because those, just by asking questions, those people came back and said, you know, months later that it completely changed their framework on their own, their own mindset. And that actually goes back to something I think you do an amazing job of, Matt, which is just like if you're empathetic and you're kind, you don't attack people personally, but you call out the fault, you know, the, the, the liars and the charlatans if you need to. You, you stand on a foundation of facts and you just ask people questions. You can change the world with that model. I really do believe that. Um, and you can dispel so much misinformation if you can get people thinking. But I think that's a really powerful tool that uh, anyone can use, politics, religion, etc., to help people get to the get, get to the bottom of things. Um, if you haven't checked that out, though, John, you should check it out. Street Epistemology is a very interesting YouTube channel I used to watch. And they still do stuff. Yeah, like it sounds that. like it should. <clears throat> yeah, I think I've seen a couple of his videos. It, didn't he go to college campuses, right? Yeah, yeah, he did that uh, a lot. Yeah, that's the same guy that Yeah, it's pretty I ran stuff. into him, Anthony Metabosco, I think. I ran into him at Politicon a couple of years ago. He's a very interesting oh, nice. dude. Yeah, very, very interesting dude. Um uh, so yeah, so okay, so we're about at an hour. Um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to pull you too, too long because I know it's, it's probably, I don't know if you're central. Is Kansas Central time? <laughs> yes. Okay, so we're same time zone. It's getting a little late. Um, <laughs> I am, I am curious. Um, uh, the only other thing that I wanted to ask you about was just broadly speaking, like, um, I think this is a good way to close out the conversation. Do you feel like there are any common issues, common ground issues? Maybe we touched on this a little bit earlier that we feel like Americans can come uh, come, come together on. Um, like at, with what Project Liberal, our goal is to build a broad, centrist, liberal movement. That's what we want to do here with this project. And you touched on a couple of things. You mentioned UBI, educational reform, things like that. But do you think there are any issues that you go, okay, the, if a political coalition was built around these issues, it would – it would bring people together. I mean, does anything stick out to you other than the ones maybe we talked about a little earlier? Uh, I think something that unites rural voters with um, urban and suburban voters. So, because I did make, I made a video about this as well, and I noticed there's, there's now such a big cultural divide. <clears throat> and I taught in a rural district, school district, and I, even like between suburb, like a wealthier suburban district and a rural district, I was like, wow, this is like two different worlds. And um, overwhelmingly, of course, in rural areas, it's, you know, they're about as red as you can get. Um, yep. And so like, I think what drives them more than anything is fear of the future, like what's going to happen to them because they're seeing their towns, if they're not close to a city, their town is shrinking. Yeah. Um, farmers that are around, they, they're making less money than they have in generations. Um, and the mom and pop stores that used to exist are now replaced by dollar generals and yeah. Walmarts. And so, um, again, I go back to, we're going to have to figure out, I think the most important thing, it's the thing that predicts election results. I, I predicted the 2020 election just by looking at economic data, you have to have economic reforms where people, I mean, that's why inflation is such an, I mean, I know inflation is going down. We're seeing, we're looking at <laughs> promising uh, statistics, but at the same time, it's, people are still feeling the pain over, you know, cumulatively the past, oh, yeah. ever since the pandemic, they haven't recovered. And so there has to be something. I mean, that's why I keep going back to UBI uh, or universal health care because, um, and I know those are big programs that, you know, could cause inflation. Mm-hmm. Probably that's a concern. Like, so I, I think that continuing to pilot those at the local level, we're seeing pilot programs around the world, um, places as diverse as Kenya to Canada to uh, Finland, and uh, and and just increasing public programs, not just for certain parts of the country, everywhere. But, like, I think if you just – seriously, if you had a presidential candidate that toured all, like, these small rural areas that have never that have never been visited by a presidential candidate, um, that guy would win. That gal would win, whoever it is. Because I think at the root of it is scarcity. <laughs> They're scared because they can't pay the bills anymore. And that's why so many also – it coincides with the um, – 
the opioid crisis that we the fentanyl i mean it's it's all related we we keep we keep pretending like oh that all this stuff is not related to economics but it is uh and then the other thing that we could reform of course is voting but that's not as sexy you know like because i noticed like the forward party they're like oh let's get on board with ranked choice voting personally i like star star voting i don't know if you're aware of it are you, yeah. have you heard of star voting oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Look at oh you. yeah nice nice oh, yeah. but anyway like, yeah, obviously voting reform is probably the most important thing we can do but yeah it's not sexy that like the voters are gonna, kind of bored by it you know they don't make the connection of like or you, you know you can increase the house the size of the house of representatives it's way too small it hasn't been oh, yeah. increased Absolutely. since 1929 i mean but i just think you're gonna have a harder time campaigning on that so whatever you campaign on it has to be something where people will have more money in their pockets <laughs> yeah I, I i i could not agree more with you now again devil's in the details on ubi and even a health care option but yeah i i could not agree more with you on the voting reform front it, it's a tragedy that it's such a non-sexy issue because it honestly <laughs> i think is the most important issue of our time like if if yeah. we found a way to introduce proportional representation, for example, oh, it would solve yes. the gerrymandering problem, right? Yep. Uh, it would, if we introduce ranked choice voting, um, it would solve the negative campaigning problem. It would yep. incentivize positive, optimistic, forward-looking people and op you know, positive messaging. Um, you know, if we could end this whole like first past the post situation, open up primaries and give independents a more of a voice. I mean, there's so many things that could be done. I do like star voting. I like approval voting. I like ranked choice voting. I think the silver bullet in a lot of ways, though, is proportional representation and uncapping the House. If you could do that, man, you would change – we'd change the future of this country forever. Um, and Rhode Island has 500 and something people in their state, state house. Like, come on. It's Rhode Island. They have – I don't know. There's the size of my neighborhood, you know? <laughs> like, come on, guys. <laughs> totally. Right. I'm, yeah. I'm in a small suburb, a small suburb of Dallas, and we've got more people than they do. Like, you know, come on. <laughs> it's true. Let's give it the times. It's true. So I couldn't agree more with you, uh, Matt. I think there's good alignment there. Um, I, I I feel like we've we've covered a lot of topics. Um, do you know? In closing, is there anything that you have on your mind that you'd like to discuss, or maybe just if you're if you're thinking maybe anything you'd like to plug, Matt? Anything on your mind? I mean, your YouTube channel is far larger than ours, but we're catching up. <laughs> um, but yeah, if no, there's anything uh, you want to plug or chat sure, about I, that we missed the floor is my, yours, my friend my channel is Mr. Beat which is just my name it's not Mr. Beast if you search Mr. Beat <laughs> Mr. Beast will show up but it's uh, but yeah to I also be, to be ahead. fair anything you search on YouTube he shows up <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point yeah also uh, but I also have another channel called The Beat Goes On which is just more music and film history uh, I've written a couple books. I'm kind of known as the president's guy online because um, I have lots of president's videos. But and but I also have a book about every presidential election in American history in a series and a book about the Supreme Court and a series about Supreme Court cases that are important as well. So if you want to know anything about American political history, I pretty much got it covered. <laughs> and thanks for uh, having me. Yeah. Yeah. No, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. I was going to say one more thing. Also, follow him on Twitter, Beatmaster Matt, if you want some non crazy, <laughs> to non toxic Twitter uh, Twitter takes. Um, so it's good stuff. But no, yeah, man. Thank you again for making time for us. I really, really did enjoy the conversation. Godspeed and keeping to fight for like level headed, normal takes um, and educating people. <laughs> and uh, hopefully, we can do this again soon. Thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate it, man.